Welcome back everyone. Final unit, unit nine, the applications of thermodynamics. I, I like this unit, this is, a, this is a fun unit. The labs are pretty fun if you're taking this into school somewhere. But let's get into it. So the first new thing that we need to introduce is something called the idea of entropy. Entropy is uh, very closely associated with the idea of randomness, okay? It is preferential to all systems, all reactions, all species, everything in the universe, everything wants to go to a higher degree of randomness, okay? And what I mean by randomness, just picture, it's a pretty good representation what instantly comes to mind when you think of random randomness. Just uncontrolled things bouncing around everywhere, okay? It, it takes energy to take randomness and confine it down to something more compact and restrained and disciplined, okay? You take a uh, snowball, okay? A snowball is a nice and compact and compressed form of matter. It doesn't really do much, okay? That has very low entropy. You throw a snowball, it impacts someone, and it bursts into a bunch of different little pieces. That form has much more entropy, okay? So I think the best way to uh, get down to it is with some examples. So the way uh, entropy uh, is it's best understood within the context of a gas, okay? So if you've got a reaction vessel and it's filled with some gas particles, okay? Those gas particles are moving around, they're bouncing off each other, they're bouncing off the walls of the container. If I increase my temperature, my entropy increases, okay? If I increase my temperature, my entropy increases. So that means that the particles are now moving around faster, okay? If you can conceptualize that, that kind of feels like a, a little bit more chaos. If I increase temperature, entropy increases. If I increase volume, entropy increases. Because if I increase volume, there's more places for stuff to go, and there's more places to move around, okay? So if I increase volume, entropy increases. There's more possible places for the matter to go, so it's more random, it's more chaotic. And the last thing is when we uh, go through phase changes, like as we go from a solid to a liquid, entropy increases. Okay, and if we go from liquid to a solid, entropy decreases. All of these examples I just provided you, the, the reverse is also true. If I decrease temperature, entropy decreases. If I decrease volume, entropy decreases. So solid, as you might imagine, is a very finite, clear-cut, stable piece of, or excuse me, state of matter. As I go to liquid, liquid can move around more chaotically. It has more entropy. I go to liquid from liquid to gas, that's more entropy, okay? That's a greater value of the entropy. If I am in a reaction where I go from a gas to a gas, then whichever side of the reaction has more particles has the greater value of entropy. Now this is the uh, same idea if I have a reaction solid to solid. If I have two moles of solid on this side working to form four moles of solid on that side, I say the entropy has increased. If I go from four moles to two moles, entropy has decreased, okay? So whichever side of the reaction produces more moles of gas, more moles of liquid, more moles of anything, that then the reaction tends towards greater entropy. So the symbol for entropy is S, okay? Commonly S naught. Each species has a standard entropy value, just like each species has a standard enthalpy value, okay? Enthalpy, entropy. And uh, just like uh, we did with enthalpy, in a reaction you have a change in enthalpy, and in a reaction you're going to have a change in entropy. This uh, not, this zero symbol in the top right, just means uh, the standard enthalpy, or the standard entropy. Uh, the not represents standard conditions. Okay, so this is the enthalpy of the species at standard condition. This is the change in entropy of the species at standard conditions. Standard conditions is 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, 
and uh, uh, one molar concentrations if you're dealing with concentrations. Okay, so let's give you an example of a reaction. Let's say methane, not methane, ethane. So in this reaction, I have four moles of gas on this side because ethane is a gas, oxygen is a gas. And I may not have mentioned this earlier, but this reaction produces gaseous H2O. It produces water vapor in addition to carbon dioxide, okay? So we've got six moles of gas on this side, five moles of gas on that side. If this was a multiple choice question and it asked you, is the entropy change for this reaction positive or negative? You'd say positive, okay? Positive meaning the reactants, excuse me, the products are have a higher entropy than the reactants. So we have a positive delta S. They, they might uh, very often, if this is an FRQ, they give you a table. The same uh, type of problem that I went over when we did uh, enthalpy, when we did delta H, they're going to give you the standard entropy of each of the species, the standard entropy C2H6, the standard entropy of uh, CO2, yada, yada, yada. And you're just going to do the basic formula. You know, we've got, we had the formula for delta H, which is delta H uh, not products minus delta H not reactants equals delta H not reaction of the reaction. And the same equation applies for entropy. Delta S not products minus delta S not reactants equals delta S not reaction. Okay? Simple, just a different application with different letters of what we did in enthalpy. Okay? So, this, uh, once we master entropy, we can come down to the real uh, main topic in this unit, and that's called delta G. Okay? Delta G stands for Gibbs free energy. Yep, it makes perfect sense, you know? Enthalpy, entropy, Gibbs free energy. Perfect naming. Anyway, so delta G uh, abides by the same, uh, same equation here. If you're given a reaction and you're given a table of uh, standard Gibbs free energy of each of the species in the reaction, delta G products minus uh, the standard Gibbs free energy reactants equals Gibbs free energy reaction. Okay, these equations, all three of them are on your reference table. Talk about redund redundancy. Very often you will not be given uh, your Gibbs free energy. It's something you're going to need to calculate. Okay, and for that we have the other equation, the delta G of the reaction, delta G naught, equals the delta H naught, the change in enthalpy, minus the temperature multiplied by the change in entropy. Now let me introduce you to what is called thermodynamic favorability. Okay, so first of all, when delta G naught once we calculate it with using this equation, when delta G naught is negative, we consider that thermodynamically favorable. When we say a reaction is thermodynamically favorable, we mean the reaction uh, releases energy, okay? And it can release energy in two ways. It can release energy in the form of heat, it can release energy in the form of entropy, or it can release energy in the form of both. And because it releases energy, we say that it happens spontaneously, okay? Now, the word spontaneously may cause some uh, confusing miscon uh, misconstructions in your mind. So, do not interpret spontaneously to mean instantly or unprompted, okay? Spontaneously just means that the reaction wants to happen. Whether or not it does happen is a matter of activation energy. It's like uh, if you look at the potential energy diagram, you know, it's reactants, ooh, products, okay? It's like a kid sliding down a slide, okay? 
The kid wants to slide down the slide, and wants to release its energy, okay? But he can't do that unless he overcomes the activation energy, unless he climbs up the ladder to get to the slide. Anyway, so a perfect example of that is diamonds decomposing into pure carbon is thermodynamically favorable. Diamonds decomposing into pure carbon releases energy. And as we know, everything wants to release its energy. Every, everything wants to be in a lower potential energy state. Okay? So why don't diamonds decompose into carbon? Because there is an immense activation energy. That's what we call kinetic control. Kinetic control means that the reaction rate, the speed of the reaction, is determined by the kinetics, aka the activation energy. If the activation energy was super low, then we would say the reaction is under thermodynamic control. It's, it's basically we come across a reaction that's supposed to be happening, but it's not. Okay, why is the reaction not happening? Well, I used the equation, delta G is negative, which means it's thermodynamically favorable. If it's thermodynamically favorable, it's not under thermodynamic control. So it must be under kinetic control. We must not have enough energy to surpass the activation energy barrier. Now, that means, hey, I'm heating this reaction to like 8,000 degrees. Why isn't anything happening? Oh, because it's not thermodynamically favorable. So that, was what, that would be what we would call under thermodynamic control. So why don't we take another look at this equation because it's a very important equation for you to be able to use, okay? This equation will most of the time just be presented to you in terms of qualitative analysis. So it's gonna say, I have a reaction with a negative delta H and a positive delta S. Is it thermodynamically favorable? And you'd say yes, even though they didn't give you a temperature, okay? You, sometimes you may not need the temperature to calculate the sine of delta G. Because, let me reiterate what I just told you, I have a reaction with a negative delta H and a positive delta S. If I have a negative term here, and I have a minus sign here, okay, a minus and a positive converts this whole term to a minus. If I have a minus and a minus here, no matter what temperature I use, this will never become positive. And you might ask yourself, hey, what if I have a negative temperature? Wouldn't that turn this into a positive term? You'd think so. But temperature is always in degrees Kelvin. You will never have a negative degrees Kelvin. That's why Kelvin was invented so that nothing in the universe could go negative, okay? I'm not sure how many of you know that. Zero in degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. No one, nothing in the universe has ever achieved zero degrees Kelvin, and it never will, okay? That's why the Kelvin scale was invented. So if I have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, I know for sure I have a negative delta G. Okay, and the same applies if I have two positive terms. If I have two positive terms, I know for sure I have a positive delta G. So because of this minus sign, in order to get a positive term, I need a negative delta S. And because of this minus sign, in order to get a negative term, I need a positive delta S. Okay? Just think about it in terms of favorability. Everyone wants to release their energy. Everyone wants to become more chaotic. Everyone wants more entropy. So negative delta H means my reaction is losing energy. Positive delta S means I'm becoming more chaotic. I have more entropy. So if I put those two together, that's a fantastically favorable delta G. Okay? Now, if you have two conflicting signs, like you have a positive delta H, and a positive delta s, so that when you introduce the negative sign in the equation, it becomes a positive and a negative term. Once you have that, then you're going to need the temperature term to calculate whether delta g is positive or negative. When delta g is positive, we say it's thermodynamically unfavorable, okay? 
Now, just because something's thermodynamically unfavorable does not mean it doesn't happen, okay? If something's thermodynamically unfavorable, then we're going to have to input our own energy to drive the reaction. Separate from activation energy. We have to input activation energy no matter what. But we need to supply some other source of energy, whether that be coupling it with another chemical reaction that releases energy, whether that be coupling it with like a battery to provide electrical energy, whether that be coupling it with a light source to provide light energy, like you see in the case of plants using photosynthesis. We have another equation for delta G, and that is delta G naught equals uh, negative RT ln K, okay? So let's break this down. We see R coming up again here. R is, if you remember, the gas law constant. What's the gas law constant doing here? Well, remember, on your reference table, you have three gas law constants. One is in units of atmospheres, the other is in units of tor, and the other doesn't have a pressure unit. It's in units of joules. Joules are units of energy. So we're going to be using that gas law constant in this case. If I look at my reference table, I'm looking at the gas law constant that is 8.314 joules per mole degree Kelvin. Okay, so that's the gas law constant we're going to be using here. Okay, now our temperature is, of course, degrees Kelvin. But I want to take your attention and have us focus on this LNK component. That means the delta G is related to K, okay? So if K, let's uh, remind ourselves of the equation for K. K equals concentration of products at equilibrium over concentration of reactants at equilibrium, okay? So if I have a really high delta K, uh, excuse me, if I have a really high K, that means at equilibrium, products are favored. And if I have a really low K, that means reactants are favored. Okay? If reactants are favored, that means the reaction doesn't really want to occur. And if products are favored, that means the reaction really wants to occur. Okay? So, if products are favored, that means that the reaction is favorable. The reaction wants to happen. The reaction wants to shift towards products. Okay? So, a positive, or a very large delta K, I should say, because K is always positive, you're never going to have a negative K. A lar very large delta K. Why do I keep saying that? A very large K is indicative of a thermodynamically favorable delta G, okay? That's why we have this negative term here. A positive K will be multiplied by this negative and yield us a negative delta G naught. But wait, Meek, you just say that K, you just said that K can never be negative. True, K can never be negative. Ln K can be negative. Ln K is negative when K is small. Ln k is negative when k is less than 1. Okay? So when k is less than 1, I, this term becomes negative, and so these negatives cancel out and produce a positive delta G for us, giving us an unfavorable reaction, all right? So what I really want to uh, have you connect for me here is how equilibrium uh, tells us something about favorability. If the products are favored at equilibrium, reaction is thermodynamically favorable. If the inverse is true, the reaction is not favorable. So I hinted at this a bit before, this idea of coupled reactions. Now we're going to see coupled reactions in just a moment when I talk about the real show-stopping topic we have in this unit. Just a little spoiler, we're going to be teaching you how to build batteries. I, I found that really cool. It was my favorite, time, favorite uh, lab that we did when we took AP Chemistry. We actually built batteries, and we could, like, power stuff with them, and I thought that was really cool. And, like, you didn't have to charge it, you didn't have to plug it in. It's just a chemical reaction that produces electricity. 
Anyway, coupled reactions. In order to uh, stimulate or drive, uh, is the better word, a reaction that has a positive delta G, an unfavorable reaction, you need to couple that with a, a favorable reaction, okay? And that favorable reaction does not necessarily need to be a chemical reaction. It can be any source of free energy, okay? So that free energy can be consumed by the unfavorable reaction and drive that. So um, I'm assuming that a lot of you have taken biology before taking this course, and if you haven't, I'd be happy to explain this too as well. Uh, in biology, we have several reactions that are coupled, okay? A uh, perfect example of this is uh, the reaction of uh, metabolizing or digesting uh, glucose. Glucose is a sugar molecule. That's where we store our energy. When we break that down, the glucose molecule releases energy, okay? So the breakdown of the glucose molecule is our favorable reaction. It releases energy. And that energy is then consumed by an unfavorable reaction. If you guys ever heard of ATP before, converting ADP to ATP is a very unfavorable reaction because ATP has a lot more energy than ADP. So this energy from the favorable reaction goes into ADP and allows it to convert to ATP. This is how our body stores energy. Now, another example of this is uh, when plants undergo photosynthesis. When plants undergo photosynthesis, they take in CO2 and H2O and they produce glucose, C6H12O6, okay? And that is a very unfavorable reaction. So it needs to be coupled with a source of energy. The plants don't couple it with another reaction, they couple it with the source of energy that is sunlight. Okay, moment you've all been waiting for, batteries, okay? These are called galvanic, also known as voltaic cells. These two words are synonyms, they will be used interchangeably on the exam. Galvanic or voltaic cells. So in a galvanic or voltaic cell, uh, let me make sure I have enough room to draw this for you. So this is a voltaic slash galvanic cell. All right, so let me explain to you what the heck is going on here. We have a redox reaction going on here, okay? Redox reaction is again, something is gaining electrons, something else is losing electrons. In this uh, cell, the reaction going on will be Sn plus uh, Cu2 plus becomes Sn2 plus plus Cu. Okay? That's the overall reaction. Okay? And you won't be given that. I'll cover in just a moment how you would derive that yourself. Okay? So, but before we get there, we're going to break this up into what we call half reactions. Okay? A half reaction is a reaction that features only the species that is being reduced, and the other half reaction features only the species that's being oxidized. So one half of the reaction would be Sn on one side becoming Sn2 plus plus 2e minus, two electrons, okay? The other half reaction would be Cu2 plus gaining two electrons to become copper, okay? Now, if we look at these two equations, uh, when we combine them, we're going to get Sn plus Cu2 plus plus 2e minus becomes Sn2 plus plus Cu plus 2e minus. E minus just represents electrons. If you see here, we have spectator ions on each side of the equation. We've got two electrons on each side of the equation, so we can cross those out and get our original equation back, okay? Now, the reason I drew, I drew attention to each of these half reactions is because one half, one of the half reactions occurs in one solution, the other 
reaction occurs in the other solution, and I call them solutions because I said previously that in one container we're going to have dissolved uh, tin to nitrate. Okay, so when that dissolves, that's going to be SN2 plus and 2NO3 minus floating in solution. And when this dissolves, this is going to be Cu2 plus and 2NO3 minus floating in solution. Okay? So this half reaction, Sn by becoming Sn2 plus. I can see that reaction happening right here. We can have tin from the electrode. Electrode is just a piece of metal. It's all it is. So a tin electrode is just a piece of tin. The tin electrode is stuck in the water, or the solution, I should say. And when Sn turns into Sn2+, plus, it just leaves the electrode and goes into solution. Okay? And when Cu2+, plus becomes copper metal, we take the Cu2 plus ion, and it joins the electrode. Okay. But what about these electrons that are participating in the reaction? Well, the electrons here, Sn, leaves the electrode to become Sn2 plus in solution, but the electrons stay behind in the electrode. Okay? And the electrons, the E minus, they travel through the wire to the copper solution. And now there are two excess electrons on the copper electrode, and those two extra electrons reunite with the copper 2 plus ion to form copper metal. Okay? But when that's happening, okay, we just added a 2 plus charge to this uh, cell, and we uh, subtracted a 2 plus charge from this cell. So let me write these outside. We put a 2 plus charge in solution here, and we took a 2 plus charge out of solution here. So now this, that we have unbalanced charges now. What are we going to do about that? Well, we're going to balance the charges. So that's why this salt bridge exists. In this bridge, we have KNO3. And when that dissociates, that's become, going to become K plus and NO3 minus. Since this cell is developing a unnaturally positive charge, we're going to need to balance that out. So the NO3 minus ions are going to flow through the salt bridge into this solution to make the solution more negative and cancel out these pluses. And the K plus is going to drift towards the solution with the minus charge to cancel out the minus charge, okay? And once all the charges have been uh, balanced out again, we can have another reaction cycle take place. Uh, tin loses electrons, copper gains electrons, and in order to get from point A to point B, the electrons need to flow through this wire. This is a battery. That is how a battery works, okay? The electrons flowing through this wire is the electricity that powers, you know, your little brother's toys. And the whole reason that this is happening is because this reaction right here, our full reaction has a negative delta G. Remember, negative delta G means it's thermodynamically favorable. It wants to happen, and it's going to release energy as it happens, okay? So that's the key thing here. You need to choose a reaction that's thermodynamically favorable. Because if it's thermodynamically favorable, it wants to happen, and if it wants to happen, it's going to have enough energy, it's going to release enough energy to push electrons through this wire. And as you push electrons through this wire, you're going to have a voltmeter, and that voltmeter is going to read a potential difference. It's going to read a voltage, like 1.12 volts. All right? Now, in chemistry, when we're dealing with batteries, when we're dealing with galvanic cells like this, uh, we have a special name for this voltage reading. It's called... E naught cell. And we have equations to calculate E naught cell. That equation is delta G, delta G naught equals negative N F E naught, E cell, E naught cell, whatever. This equation, also on your reference table, is very important because it relates to us 
the value of delta G, remember the value of delta G is how favorable is the reaction, and the value of V-naught cell, which is the voltage, the energy that we're harnessing from the reaction. A positive voltage, a positive voltage is something we can harness. That's a positive voltage that drives your computer, the positive voltage that drives your phone, okay? So, if we have a positive voltage here, we're going to need to introduce a negative symbol to equate that to a negative delta G. Now, let me introduce you to these two terms right here. First is the capital F. The capital F is Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is on your reference table, and if you look at it, it is 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. Those are the units of Faraday's constant, coulombs per mole of electrons. Now, the units for voltage, and subsequently the units for E cell, are joules per coulomb. Units of delta G are joules. Okay? So, given those units, let me tell you what N is. N is your moles of electrons. Okay, how do I calculate moles of electrons? I've never heard that before. Very easy. Okay? First of all, this reaction right here, okay? It's all based on stoichiometry. I have one mole of tin reacting to form one mole of copper. Okay? So it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So one mole of tin is being used up for every reaction cycle. One mole. Okay? One mole of tin. How many electrons are present in one reaction cycle? I consult one of my half reactions. Two electrons are present in each reaction cycle. So if I have one mole of tin, that means I have two moles of electrons. So that's my N. Two moles of electrons. Just how many electrons are participating in the reaction. Okay? So I gave you an example value right here, 1.12 volts. Using that value, I can calculate the delta G for the reaction. E naught cell is 1.12 volts, 1.12 joules per coulomb. Okay? I multiply that by my 96485. Uh, coulombs per mole of electrons times 96 comma 485 C per mole, okay? My coulombs cancel out and now I have 1.12 times 96485 joules per mole of electrons and then I multiply that by my two moles of electrons such that these cancel out and now I'm just left with uh, 2.24 times 96485. And I can't forget my negative sign. I'm going to negate that, and that equals my delta G. You'll see. My delta G is very large. Why is it so large? Because I'm in units of joules. Very often, delta G is in units of kilojoules. And very often, if this were an FRQ, they would ask you for units of kilojoules. So, before you circle this as your final answer, look back. Is the question asking me for kilojoules? And if it is, you convert this right here to kilojoules. So this is in joules. To get to kilojoules, I divide the whole thing by 1,000, right? I hope we all know how to convert between orders of units. What happens if we take a look at an unfavorable reaction? Okay, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable going this way. Hey, I got an idea. It's probably, well, it's definitely thermodynamically unfavorable to go the other way. So let's write that out. Uh, metallic copper reacting with SN2 plus to produce metallic tin plus uh, copper 2 plus. Okay, this is just the reverse reaction. If this was thermodynamically favorable, this is thermodynamically unfavorable. Okay. Whatever delta G we calculated for this, it's going to be the same delta G here, except positive. 
So if we were to draw the same exact cell right here, and except uh, it's actually, yeah, it's the same exact cell. On one end, you've got copper 2 plus and metallic copper. On the other end, you've got SN2 plus and metallic tin. So we're able to harness 1.12 volts as the electrons are traveling this way, as this reaction is happening. As we keep using the battery, we're eventually going to run out of metallic tin, okay? Now, that's an interesting property of the galvanic and voltaic cell. The electrode is made of tin. So, as tin is leaving the electrode and going into solution, the mass of the electrode is decreasing, right? Because I've got less tin as metal and more tin in the solution. So, the electrode itself shrinks. It's a very, very common way for them to ask you questions on the, F on the uh, AP exam. They're going to tell you, okay, the mass of the tin electrode decreased by 0.6 grams, okay? And if it tells you that the mass of the tin electrode decreased by 0.6 grams, you're going to have to know, okay, I'm going to convert 0.6 grams to moles. Now that I have moles of uh, tin that left the electrode, I can figure out, okay, this many moles left the electrode. Therefore, that same amount of moles must have transfer, been transferred to the other electrode. That many moles of reaction happened. Okay, if that many moles of reaction happened, I can calculate how many moles of electrons were transferred. So they're going to ask you questions like that. So be prepared to identify what it's telling you when it says the mass of this electrode decreased by 0.6 grams, or the mass of this electrode increased by 0.6 grams. As I was saying, the electrode's eventually going to get used up. Or something, there's eventually going to be no more salt in the salt bridge, so the uh, charges can't stabilize and the, um, and the cell doesn't work anymore. We can then throw the reaction in reverse. Instead of electrons going this way, what we can do is we can harvest two electrons from metallic copper, send copper 2 plus into the solution, and send electrons this way, so as to pull uh, the tin ion out of solution and convert it back into metallic tin. Okay? Now if we go the other way, this is now going to become a negative 1.12 volts. That means we need to apply 1.12 volts to the uh, reaction in order for it to progress. We need to apply 1.12 volts in order to send electrons back the other way. This, when the uh, voltage is negative, is an electrolytic cell. That's what we call it. And notice how I did not change anything about the cell itself. I just said, okay, we ran out of salt bridge or we ran out of electrode. Time to go in reverse. So galvanic cells can be converted to electrolytic cells and the other is possibly true. Not necessarily, but possibly. So let's take a look at what's happening here. I'm applying voltage to the battery to reverse the reaction. I am recharging my battery, okay? This is how rechargeable batteries work, okay? They come from the factory charged, you know, you use up their voltage, and once you have dead battery, then you apply your own voltage back into it to recharge it, and then the cycle repeats. So, a little uh, mnemonic that I want you to memorize so that uh, you won't get tripped up by these questions on the exam. They're going to ask you, at which electrode does oxidation happen, and in at which electrode does reduction happen? So, where are we gaining electrons? We're gaining electrons in this reaction. We're gaining electrons at the, at the copper electrode, okay? So reduction is happening here, and we are losing electrons. Leo the lion says grr, loss of electrons is oxidation. So we've got oxidation happening at this electrode. The electrode at which oxidation takes place is called the anode, and the electrode at which reduction takes place is called the cathode. An, ox, red, cat. Okay? Anox, oxidation, anode, red cat, reduction, cathode, okay, just 
Just know the tricks. All right? Anyway. Okay. So the next part of this is best understood within the context of an equation. It's another equation that you're provided on your reference table. The equation is E cell equals E not cell minus RT over NF multiplied by LNQ. Okay? So there's a couple of very key points that this uh, equation makes for us. First of all, we're using Q here. Up there, we were using K, okay? Well, why did I erase it? Negative RT ln K. Okay, so we have a delta G naught here when we're dealing with K, but we have an E without a naught when we're dealing with Q, okay? Remember what I said at the beginning of the video when I told you what that naught means, okay? The naught means standard conditions. 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, and one molar concentrations, okay? E cell means we're deviating from our one molar concentrations. We're deviating from our standard conditions, okay? So this equation helps us analyze how the cell behaves when we deviate from those standard conditions, okay? So you're really only ever going to see changes, or deviations, I should call them, in temperature and in concentration. We have a T term for temperature to help us analyze changes in temperature, and we have a Q term for analyzing changes in concentration, okay? Because remember, when we're changing concentrations, we're no longer at equilibrium anymore, so we can't use K. The entire basis of the electrolytics, not elect, the entire basis of the galvanic cell is the basis of a reaction going to equilibrium, okay? This reaction, uh, when we convert, uh, when we're redoxing tin and copper, is going towards equilibrium, okay? And the equilibrium, as we have already showed, strongly prefers metallic copper and SN2+, okay? So, in order for the reaction to go to equilibrium, it first has to start at Q. It first has to start at some concentration that is away from equilibrium, right? So let's say that we uh, reach equilibrium at the one molar concentration of Cu, excuse me, one molar concentration of Sn2+, plus, because Cu is a metal, it can't participate, and a 0.5 molar concentration of Cu2+, plus, okay? Let's say that's equilibrium. In order to form Sn2+, plus, in order to push towards reactants, I need to have a smaller K, or excuse me, I need to have a smaller Q so that Q goes to K. So for a Q, I would need like something smaller, like a 0.5 SN2 plus over a one Cu2 plus. So the gist of this equation is telling us that the, the further we are from equilibrium, the more powerful the cell is. The further we are from equilibrium, the more forceful the reaction will proceed to equilibrium, okay? And that also means the closer we get to equilibrium, the lower our voltage becomes. The further away you are, the higher the voltage is, the closer you get, the lower the voltage is. And again, with temperature, it all depends on equilibrium, right? So this E0 cell is something you calculate, something you'll be given, probably, and you're going to have to analyze if we distance ourselves further from equilibrium, how does that affect E cell, and if we change the temperature, how does that affect E cell. And one final uh, equation that we got introduced, this is the video of equations, is the equation I equals Q over T, okay? This is an equation very commonly used with stoichiometry. All right, so let me tell you exactly what's going on here. I represents current. Q represents coulombs. T represents time, pay attention to me, in seconds. Okay? So, 
uh, what I hinted at before. When they uh, told, if they tell you, okay, I have 0 0.6 grams of the tin electrode. The tin electrode lost 0 0.6 grams of mass, okay? So I have 0 0.6 grams of mass was lost by the tin electrode, okay? The, they're gonna, the question's gonna give you that, and they're gonna ask you, how much current passed through the battery, how much current passed through the battery during those uh, 500 seconds where we lost 0 0.6 grams? Okay, so they're going to give you like 500 seconds or they're going to give you four minutes and they're going to hope that you remembered what I told you to convert to seconds. Okay, so 0 0.6 grams SM, I'm going to go to my periodic table, and as you should instinctually do, I'm going to convert to moles. Okay, so SN is a transition metal, tin. It has a molar mass of 118.71, so I'm going to take 0 0.6 divided by 118.71. I'm going to get 0 0.0051 moles of uh, tin. Okay, so 0 0.0051 moles of tin reacted. Therefore, if I know how many moles reacted, I can calculate how many moles of electrons reacted. Two moles of electrons react for every mole of tin, so I multiply that value by two. That gives me uh, 0 0.0101 of E minus. Okay, now that I have moles of electrons, uh, I can use my uh, Faraday's constant. Remember, Faraday's constant is in, they give you the units of Faraday's constant, so you don't need to memorize them. It's 96485 coulombs per mole of electrons, so I take my mole of electrons, I multiply it by 96485, and now I have how many coulombs that are uh, produced. Now I have coulombs, okay. I have, that gave me 97.33 coulombs. Now we divide by time in seconds, over 500 seconds, and that gives me units of current. 1.95 units of current is amps. That's a very common type of FRQ. They're going to ask you how much current went through the system if I lost this many grams of this electrode or gained this many grams of the other electrode. All right, that's unit guide nine, guys. Again, you have any questions, you join my Discord server, you DM me, you ask me, whatever. I'm here for you guys. Enjoy life.